Now, last time, we had an ecumenical council that put the Western Church back together. Maybe we could have a council to put the East and the West back together. What do you think? Let's talk about it at Sunday School. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm Father Timothy Matkin, your instructor. We're glad you joined us for this session. Before we begin, if you would look down below and bless that like button, it would help us out greatly. Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications to find out when a vid new video is out. And you can share these with others on Facebook or Twitter so other people can learn about these topics. Before we begin as well, we want to have some time of prayer. I invite you to join with me in the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be. And I'll offer the collect for the Universal Church from Archbishop William Laud. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And now the collect for the Universal Church. Let us pray. O gracious Father, we humbly beseech Thee for Thy holy Catholic Church, that Thou wouldst be pleased to fill it with all truth, in all peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, establish it. Where it is in want, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. For the sake of Jesus Christ, Thy Son, our Lord. Amen. Our study is based on the book by John L. Murray called The General Councils of the Church with some additional resources thrown in here and there. Now, last week we looked at the first Council of Constance, well, the only Council of Constance, which dealt with the papal schism in which there were up to three rival claimants for the papacy all at the, all at the same time. And this persisted for decades. And unlike many antipopes of the current day, these actually had followers. All of Europe, in fact, was broken up along lines of allegiance to one or the other as the true Pope. France, Naples, Scotland, and Spain held their allegiance to the Pope in Avignon. Portugal, England, Ireland, Sweden, Denmark, Poland, Hungary, and of course Italy threw in their lot with the Pope in Rome. The Germanic tribes were all over the place. And then when the Council of Pisa tried to solve the problem with a new pope, well, that turned out simply to be a third pope who garnered the allegiance of much of the Roman line and, and oddly France, which is where Avignon is. Yet the popes in Rome and Avignon still held on to many places despite the new Pisan line. The Council of Constance succeeded where Pisa had failed, mainly because they got rid of the old popes before making a new one. It took a council of the whole church meeting together to sort out the schism. A council, by nature, should be the place where old rivalries and divisions can be sorted out. One bit of unfinished business from the first council of Lyon was one of Pope Innocent IV's five contemporary wounds of the mystical body of Christ, if you recall, one of which was the schism of the Eastern Church. Perhaps with the help of the Holy Ghost, a council could sort out those, those old rivalries and divisions and put the Eastern and Western Church back together as one. Ever since the 11th century, shortly after the division really solidified, the problem of reunion with the East has been a special concern of the Church in the West. The Council of Florence in the 15th century stands as a testimony to this concern. 
Before going on with a discussion of that particular gathering, however, we ought to turn back the wheels of time for a moment to consider a similar attempt in the 13th century, the Second Council of Lyon, which we skipped over before. Now, both of these councils failed to achieve the goal that they sought, but they did witness to the desire for reunion between East and West, and in addition, they resulted in our clearest doctrinal statements regarding the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Trinity. After a vacancy of nearly three years following the death of Clement IV, the cardinals, I guess, were pretty comfortable not bothering to have a new pope. Sometimes there is a, a, a very tight um, standoff and no one wants to give. Usually there's a compromise candidate, but for three years, no compromise was in the making, and people seemed to be fine with that. At least the cardinals did. But after this three-year interregnum, Pope Gregory X was finally elected in September of 1271. He was crowned at Rome in March of 1272, and he immediately announced the convocation of a general council. He named Lyon in France as the city where the council would be held. As with the Lateran councils of the 12th and 13th centuries, the Second Council of Lyon was to be concerned with the need of reform within the Church. In calling it, Gregory was also troubled about the loss of a large part of the Holy Land, as well as what this implied, the continuing progress of Islam. This non-Christian religion was a constant threat to the Christian world during these ages, both a political threat and a religious one. And in fact, in Islam, there really is no distinction between those two. And if the Turks conquered the West, both the Christian faith and in fact Western civilization could be seriously challenged, perhaps even destroyed. Gregory's special concern was for the reunion with the Greeks, moreover. As soon as he called the council, he notified Joseph, the patriarch of the Greeks, of his intention. At the same time, he communicated with Michael the Eighth, Paleoglos, Paleo, Paleologos. I'm going to have difficulty with some of these Greek names. And he's the Greek emperor, and he invited him to attend, either personally or through his legates, who are granted power to act on behalf of him. Now, the Pope had chosen Lyon as the city for the council because he himself had been a canon of Lyon and had also taken part in the first council there. Hence, he knew its resources for such a gathering. By way of preparation, he named the five new cardinals who would play very important roles at the gathering. Among them was the Bishop of Lyon at the time, Peter of Tarentes, who later became Pope Innocent V, and St. Bonaventure, who was the superior, superior general of the Franciscans. The Pope himself arrived in Lyon in November of 1273 to preside at the council, and soon afterward the other members of the council gathered. Second Lyon is noteworthy for the personages who attended the council. In addition to Pope Gregory himself, three future popes were present, and another was active in the preparations. St. Bonaventure and St. Albert the Great were both present, and eventually the representatives of the Greek emperor also appeared. St. Thomas Aquinas was supposed to be there, but he died on the way to the council. In all, about 500 bishops and cardinals attended together with more than a thousand other member of the, members of the clergy. While the pope actually presided, the dominant role was played by St. Bonaventure and Peter of Tarentes the local bishop. The council opened officially on May 7, 1274, in the Cathedral Church of St. John. The Pope spoke of the threefold purpose of the council, reunion with the Greeks, general reforms, and the problem with the Holy Land. Early in the proceedings, word came that the legates from the Greeks will attend. The second and third sessions May 18th and June 7th, were especially concerned with preparations for that meeting. 
but some disciplinary decrees were also formulated during that time. The Greek representatives finally arrived at Lyon on June 24th. Among them were the Patriarch of Constantinople himself and the Metropolitan of Nicaea. They met with the Pope and presented letters from the Emperor and the Greek prelates, testifying their willingness to accept the faith proclaimed and professed by Rome. On June 29th, the Feast of St. Peter and Paul, the Pope celebrated a solemn Mass in the cathedral, during which the Epistle, the Gospel, were chanted both in Latin and in Greek. In the Credo, the Creed, the Greeks repeated three times in their own language the controversial phrase concerning the Holy Spirit, that He proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now this was especially really astounding, not just unique, because usually when you have an East and West gathering and the Greek creed is proclaimed, it's always the original one, even in the Catholic Church in the Eastern Rites. When you have any gathering between East and West, you always recite the original version in Greek and then the Latin with the addition of the Filioque in Latin. At the fourth session, July 6th, there was a solemn profession of faith. George Akrepolota, the special representative of Michael Paleologos, recited it in the name of the emperor. The others did likewise, all accepting the primacy of the Roman pontiff. Now let's pause there for a moment. The Eastern Church has always accepted the primacy of Rome. The difficulty really is not so much about whether Rome has the primacy, it's more about what exactly does that mean, having the primacy. Certainly, there's no problem with a primacy of honor and respect and veneration. Rome is number one. It was the seat of Peter. It was the old capital. It came first. It always came first. Really, the question was more juridical. How much power and authority by divine right does the Pope have? outside of his own immediate jurisdiction in the Diocese of Rome, in the province of Rome, in the nation of Italy, in Western Europe, and so on. A solemn Te Deum of thanksgiving was intoned by the Pope, sung both in Latin and in Greek. The work of reunion was apparently achieved. The Council then turned its attention to the remaining problems, above all the matter of papal elections, Gregory X wished to be sure that no more three-year vacancies would ever recur in the papal throne. His suggestions, however, met with some opposition. In the end, he won out, and it was decreed that the conclave should begin ten days after the Pope's death. Those present should remain until the Pope is elected. They can't go home and relax. And, in fact, to hurry them along... The regulation was added that if a pope were not chosen within three days, only one dish is to be served for the cardinal's dinner. If the election continued eight days, only bread, wine, and water would be served until the election was complete. As for the hopes of reunion, they were, shall we say, stillborn. The break resulted largely from political considerations, and so also did the reunion. Hence, it really wasn't lasting, and couldn't be lasting, if that was the only reason that the sides were put back together. The third canon of 1st Constantinople and the 28th canon of Chalcedon had set a spirit of competition between Constantinople and Rome. Carolarius had made the final break with 1054, while there were many, even in the 13th century, who did not think of it as a lasting break. Nothing really was done effectively to bridge the gap until Pope Gregory X attempted it at this council. Politically, there was the fear that union with Rome would mean the end of the Eastern Empire. Of course, they called it the Roman Empire, but the end of their way of life, and the re-establishment of Latin rule. 
Religiously, there were objections above all because of the filioque, that clause added to the creed, meaning and the son, which by now had become a major concern in the East. The unwillingness of the Eastern patriarch to be considered anything less than an equal with the Roman pontiff also entered into the picture. Pope Urban IV and Pope Clement IV had both made some vague moves for reunion immediately before Gregory. They had always been careful to insist, however, that a future council would not be called to gather together for debating, but more for the acceptance of the Roman faith. Despite this, one doctrine was discussed at the Second Council of Lyon. The first canon proclaimed that the Holy Spirit proceeded or came forth from the Father and the Son, as in the Latin Creed, and proceeded, quote, as from one principle. That is, there were not two eternal sources of the life of the third person, the Father and the Son. The life of the Trinity was communicated to the Spirit by the Father and the Son as though from only one principle or source. So this basically affirmed the doctrine shared by East and West, explaining that the addition to the creed was not a change in doctrine, but rather a defense of that doctrine against the Arians in Spain. This manner of expression satisfied the Greek representatives. Moreover, this was an important declaration of Catholic belief. Michael VIII, Paleologos, however, had most probably consented to the council more because of political motives than because of religious ones. He really was fearful of Charles of Anjou, the king of Sicily, who threatened his power. Union with Rome was the one sure way of tying the hands of Charles. In addition, the people of the East were strongly opposed to union with Rome, really for emotional reasons, both the clergy and the laity. When after the Second Council of Lyon was concluded, attempts were made to put the agreed reunion into practice, the populace split violently into two parties, one in favor, one against. Above all, opposition seemed to arise among the monks, who were particularly influential with the people. A good number finally reached the position where they would rather see the kingdom perish than consent to destroy what they considered the purity of their orthodox faith with the heresy of Rome. From the Roman side, the change in popes during the years immediately following the council hampered further progress on that side. As one writer commented, during those crucial years, a series of popes passed over the papal throne like meteors. There were five popes in the nine years between 1276 and 1285. That made it very difficult to give stability to those plans. As a result of this lack of success, relations cooled again between Rome and Constantinople. Paleologos had realized that union with Rome would not be the political help he had hoped for. Even though he continued diplomatic relations with Rome, he actually began arranging a military offensive against the West. All of this finally resulted in the excommunication of Paleologos by Pope Martin IV. The emperor died in 1282. Under his son, Andronicus, the anti-Roman reaction took over completely, and the hopes of the Second Council of Lyon were entirely crushed. In the 15th century, a second, though fruitless, attempt was made to secure the reunion of the East and the West. As we've already noted before, this union had its first start at Basel, which we talked about briefly last week. That resulted in a repetition of the worst days of Constance. The council had its real start then after that at Ferrara in 1438, and later moved to Florence, and actually finally concluded in Rome. 
When the Council of Constance had cleared up the papal schism and elected Pope Martin V, there was still much to be accomplished in the way of reform. In fact, few popes had ever been elected with more perils at hand. The final acts of the Council of Constance gave rise to perhaps the most grave problem of all, the challenge to the primacy of the Roman pontiff, even within the West. As we've seen, this challenge did not die at Constance. It was revived at Basel and continued to trouble the popes for many years. When Pope Eugene IV finally broke completely with the Council of Basel, he did so by a decree issued in January 1438, which transferred the council to Ferrara in Italy. Many bishops followed the decree, and they set out for Ferrara, leaving behind a clearly schismatic group that continued its strivings for 11 more years. The Council of Florence was, in reality, a fresh start. It's divided into three periods. The first at Ferrara, from January 8, 1438, to January 10, 1439. And then in Florence, from February 22, 1439, to April 26, 1442. And then finally in Rome. April 26, 1443 to August 7, 1445. It was a bit of a marathon, but it's known by the name of the Council of Florence, since that was where the bulk of the work got done, I suppose. Florence was a city far more acceptable to the Greeks to begin with, and now they were on the way. They had at least insisted on some place in Italy for the meeting, so Ferrara would also have been acceptable. As at Second Lyon, unfortunately, we're faced here with conflicting motives. There was in the Western Church a sincere desire for religious reunion, shared by many in the East. It would also help a united Europe, Christian Europe, stand up against the progress of Islam, always a perpetual threat. The Emperor John VIII, Paleologos, however, he could feel the breath of the Turks on his neck, as at Second Leon we can perceive politics and military security as being the chief motive of the emperor in agreeing to any reunion with Rome. Many of the Greek bishops also failed to share his enthusiasm for reunion, but they kind of just went along with it. Some, in fact, had, to the emperor eventually, uh, forbade them to speak against it any further, they were uh, a bit of rabble-rousers, and he had to restrain them somewhat. The Roman pontiff, the Pope, had arranged for the travel of the Greek delegates to Italy. They landed at Venice on February 8, 1438, and they reached Ferrara in the early part of March. While waiting for them to arrive, the Western bishops had opened the council as on the planned date of January 8, 1438. There had been a number of preliminary sessions, suspending the schismatic group at Basel and making plans for discussions with the Greeks. Once they had landed in Venice, however, the division between the Greeks, as well as their extreme sensitivity, became quite apparent. Even before they arrived, they seemed to have all chosen sides for or against reunion. They also fell into minor disputes concerning the manner in which they ought to greet the Pope, and the proper order of precedence among the bishops, and their ever-recurring problem at this council, the question of the financial reimbursement that they were to receive. Well, they arrived at Ferrara in full splendor. The details of precedence were all somehow sorted out but not without a great deal of fuss concerning the position of the various thrones and their respective heights. At last, on April 9th, a truly fantastic picture was unveiled in the Church of St. George. The Latins gathered on the Gospel side and the Greeks on the Epistle side. The Emperor was present, as well as his son, Demetrius, who happened to be against the idea of union. The Pope was also there, as well as Joseph II, the Patriarch of Constantinople. Now, Joseph at that time was a kind of a sick old man who favored the Union. 
and who made this long journey really for that reason, knowing full well that he probably would never be able to return home. Among the Latins, the dominant figure was Cardinal Caesarini. For the Greeks, there was Bessarion, the Archbishop of Nicaea, who favored union from sincere motives, and also Mark of Ephesus, who was violently opposed to union. Never had the Western world seen such a magnificent gathering of personages as this. But then there came a temporary halt in the proceedings. The emperor was particularly upset because none of the Western princes had shown up. He could hardly satisfy his political and military plans if no one but disputing priests were there to talk to. For this reason, nothing really important was done for the next six months, until October 8, when the temporal princes finally arrived. The emperor went hunting, the cardinals and bishops had dinners, and the financial resources for supporting them all ran lower and lower. Eventually, a commission of theologians, half Latin and half Greek, was appointed to discuss the main problems, which were the procession of the Holy Spirit, the use of unleavened bread in the West, the idea of purgatory, and the primacy of the Pope. At long last, the first important session got underway on October 8, 1438, in the Pope's chapel. About 200 bishops took part in the proceedings of the council. In all, 16 sessions took place at Ferrara from that date until January 10, 1439. The situation was somewhat different than that which was adopted at the Second Council of Lyon, for in this instance the theological questions were debated quite openly, particularly, of course, that concerning the filioque. While Photius and Carolarius had mentioned this question, it did not have the import with them that it later assumed, which was now very central for the Eastern Church. The Second Council of Lyon had, of course, solved one principal objection. It defined that the Western Church held the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son as from one principle and not from two distinct sources, which was a criticism of and the Son or filioque. This was a real concern for some theologians in the East. Antiquity noted that the two phrases had been used to explain this doctrine. Once Arianism had been conquered, all agreed that the Son proceeded from the Father. The attention now centered upon the eternal relationship of the Holy Spirit to these other two personages of the Son and the Father. One phrase, used by some Latin writers but favored in the East, stated that the Spirit proceeded from the Father through the Son. The other, used by some Greek writers but favored in the West, stated that the Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. Through the efforts of Bessarion and George Scalarios, a learned layman, the Greeks at Florence were convinced that the two phrases basically meant the same thing. A statement of this fact was incorporated into the final decree. The argument continued, however, on a more technical point. The Council of Ephesus had decreed that no one could add anything to the Nicene Creed, or really the Creed of Constantinople. Thus the Greeks insisted that the Church of Rome could not add filioque, and the Latins insisted that they did have the authority to do so. In the background, of course, was the question of papal authority in situations like that, addressing doctrinal issues. This particular point had been debated ever since the first contact with Alcuin and the other Western theologians who attended the Second Council of Nicaea as representatives of Charlemagne. The phrase was certainly added to the creed, perhaps in Spain, and then the practice spread from there. The Greeks were fond of citing Pope Leo III, who at the beginning of the 9th century refused to admit the phrase into the creed when recited at Rome. His reason was that the teaching, although it meant the same thing, um, there was no reason to add it to the creed. Um, The creed the way it was, was a sufficient expression of the faith. 
With time, these problems were solved, but they weren't solved at Ferrara. The plague had come to Ferrara, and this suggested a move. In addition, the Pope was no longer able to pay for the food, lodging, and wages associated with the council. Robbers had continually interfered with the delivery of funds from Rome. The people of Florence, however, agreed to undertake support of the council, and the Greeks, at first somewhat unwilling, agreed when it was stated that their back wages would be forthcoming in Florence. At Florence, the emperor apparently got tired of priestly debates and was sorry that no other princes came. His main desire was now to conclude a union and just leave. Since this demanded unity among the Greek theologians, the emperor stepped in and silenced those who were against union, who already were decreasing in number. This did not exactly rush matters, but along a new system of commissions, uh, they met separately rather than in a full session. A final formula of union was worked out. On June 8, 1439, the Greeks finally accepted the points on the procession of the Holy Spirit, and between then and July 5th, the other questions were discussed and acceptable formulas were devised. The ailing patriarch Joseph II died on June 10th. Some of the other Greek bishops, as well as the learned layman Scalarios, purposely left the council about the same time before, before the solemn signing of the decree. One bishop stayed, steadfastly refusing to sign. Mark of Ephesus. He really wanted to make his point. This manner of avoiding the question of signing the decree is quite significant in view of what happened after the council ended. When the time for the official signing arrived, the Greeks gathered with the emperor to place their signatures on the final formula. This occurred on July 5, 1439. In all, 33 Greek representatives signed. At the same time, the Latins met with the Pope at the Church of St. Maria Novella, where 117 more signed. The next day, the Pope celebrated a solemn Mass in the Cathedral at Florence, where the final decree was read aloud. Soon after, the Emperor and the other Greek delegates were on their way home. Certain matters were left unsolved, especially the election of a new patriarch in Constantinople, and the problem of what to do when one city had two bishops, you know, like a Latin and a Greek bishop. This was eventually solved according to which bishop died first, and then the diocese reverted to the other right. The Council of Florence continued after the Greeks left, but we know little about it after that. The schism at Basel had to be discussed, and new requests came from other Oriental bishops that were seeking union. The Armenians were on their way when the first decree was being formulated. They arrived as the Greeks were leaving. A formula of agreement was drawn up for them, although in practice nothing ever came of it. The situation had changed radically when their delegates returned home. In 1442, a similar decree was issued for the Jacobites, sent by the king of Ethiopia, and again it was not of lasting value. As with the Second Council of Lyon, the Council of Florence failed to achieve a lasting reunion. The mixed motives involved in achieving a formula of union could not be overcome. Of the Eastern Rites, now in union with Rome, the so-called Uniettes, all but one group returned, at various times and places and in smaller numbers, after the 16th century. Only the Maronites lay claim to having always remained Catholic. In 1443, Pope Eugene IV left Florence to move the council a third time, now to the Lateran Basilica at Rome. There was the danger of the antipope, Felix V, elected at Basel, as well as the desire expressed by some to transfer the council back up to the north again. It appeared safer to continue the council in Rome to avoid any such moves. The transfer had the added advantage of putting the Pope closer to the source of funds for such a gathering. The council remained in Rome from 1443 
until 1445, the date usually set for its end. It accomplished nothing important that we know of. We're not even quite sure just how or when it ended. The 15th century historian lost much of his interest when the Greeks departed for Constantinople. Apparently, reunion with some other Oriental groups was affected, but this was done probably by way of imitation and out of fear of the Turks, and again with no lasting effect. Meanwhile, in Constantinople, the work accomplished at Florence was rapidly coming to naught. The emperor attempted to adhere to the agreement with the pope, as did his successor. Remember, his successor wasn't a favorite in the first place. But he pressed on, as his father willed, but the people were opposed. In fact, 13 years later, the emperors had not yet dared to publish the decrees signed in Florence. And all the while, those opposed to union were violently attacking the notion. This included Scalarios, who had apparently undergone a bit of a change of heart. He had been in favor of union at first, but not at the close of the discussions. He had now become a monk and a most violent anti-unionist. The entire mentality of the period was summed up in the phrase, better the turban of the prophet than the tiara of the pope. Well, the next pope, Nicholas V, insisted that the emperor publish the decrees, which finally he did. Nicholas also sent him what help he could, but it was already too late. Constantinople was doomed to fall. In fact, it fell to the Mohammedans on May 29, 1453, thus spelling the end of all hopes of lasting reunion. Strangely, Muhammad II, who took over the rule, did not crush out the religion as one might fear. Instead, he chose to give the Greek nation a sort of autonomous organization under the direction of its religious leader. For this task, the clergy elected none other than Gennadius, the monk, the religious name of Scalarios. Thus the scene ended. Gennadius, Scalarios, ruled only a few years, returning to his monastery in 1456, but the pattern was established and has continued until today, where the church is governed under Muslim rule. While the Council of Florence, like Second Leon, failed to bring about a lasting union, it is remarkably indicative of the action of the Holy Spirit in working through these problems between East and West, even when we didn't abide by his guide to bring us back together. Out of such a conglomeration of elements and cross motives, two particularly important results can be detected. One, the Church received its most clear and explicit statements concerning the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, a formula worked out in the discussions between the Eastern and Western theologians. Moreover, the authority of the Roman pontiff, that had been so challenged after the Council of Constance, now emerged more firmly established in doctrinal matters than before. Unfortunately, the needed work of reform was never accomplished back then. It should have been attended to long before. All of these other concerns sidetracked that particular problem, corruption, and that was with tragic results. Very shortly, the Protestant revolt would break forth in full fury to be met by the much-needed Council of Reform, the Council of Trent. Well, thank you for joining us for this session on the Council of Florence and Second Leon. Next week, we'll look at two councils which both preceded and followed the Protestant revolt. If you're in Dallas, I invite you to come by and join us for worship you can look us up and learn all about us at sdfrancisdallas.org. Please like and share, and we will see you there. God bless.